Hi folks! Welcome to this recap of the techniques in algebra for Math AASL in the IB program. This presentation is not produced by IBO or endorsed by it, it's just one that I made for my students in PEI Canada. This presentation doesn't have an exhaustive list of all the things in algebra, but it's a good overview of the key concepts. You'll find timestamps and downloadable notes in the video description below. You can also make use of YouTube's many accessibility options, and one of the best ways to get the most out of this presentation is to pause the video and try the questions and then see if they worked out for you. There are often many different ways to solve a problem, so if you have a way that's different than mine, great, keep doing what you're doing. And finally, remember that the best way to prepare for your exams is to actually do some mathematics. Okay, let's dive in. The first topic that we'll take a look at is exponents and logarithms. In the SL course, we stick to the real number system, so we're looking at exponent rules where the bases are greater than zero. And we get these rules. A negative exponent flips it upside down. Anything to the power of zero is one. Uh, if we have fractional exponents, those represent roots for the bottom of the exponent and powers for the top of the exponent. So it's often easier to take the root first. One thing to watch out for, a common mistake, is that if you have a plus b to the m, so if you have something like this, that is not equal to a squared plus b squared. You have to actually distribute that out. The property is true for powers of 1, but you're unlikely to see that. And then we've got some over here that say if you've got the quotient to a power, that's each of the terms to the power divided and so on. So let's try a few of these. 3 to the negative 2 means 1 over 3 squared, or 1 over 9. 4 to the 3 over 2, that means the type of root we take is a second root, or a square root, and then we'd cube it. So that means 2 cubed, or 8. If we have the same bases, and we're multiplying, then we add our exponents. So that would become x to the 8, if we have powers to powers, then we multiply those powers. So 5 times 3 gives us 15. And lastly, if we have multiple terms raised to a power, then we can distribute that 4 in there and multiply each of the powers. So this would be x to the 8, y to the 12. The current curriculum does deal with scientific notation. So that's where you have a number between 1 and 10 times 10 to the power of some integer. So let's do it in the context of finding the volume of a cube with side lengths of 4 times 10 to the 13 meters. So that's a very big cube, but the volume of the cube is just side length cubed. So for us, that would be 4 times 10 to the 13 all cubed. And what we can do is we can just distribute that cubed inside. So that'll be 4 to the 3 times 10 to the 13 times 3, that's 10 to the 39 or 64 times 10 to the 39. That's not in scientific notation, or in the form that's given here. So I can think about what this really means. That means 6.4 times 10 times 10 to the 39. Right, 64 is just 6.4 times 10. And now we can add up some exponents, and this is given to us as 6.4 times 10 to the, that was 10 to the 1, so 1 plus 39 is 40. There we go. You might have to do this either without or with your GDC. So there's just a quick example. Moving on to logarithms. The expression log base 2 of 1 8 is asking you a question. It's saying, what power needs to be applied to 2 in order to make 1 8 In other words, it's 2 to the power of what makes 1 8 well, Let's think about that. It's got to be a negative power to flip it upside down, and it's got to be a cube to turn it into an 8. So, Log base 2 of 1 8 is negative 3. You need to be able to change uh, an equation from logarithmic to exponential form, and here is the property. Log base a of b equals x is the same thing as saying a to the x equals b. So if we want to solve this equation over here, there are many ways to solve it. But I want to take the time here to switch forms and to also highlight a really common solving technique that we'll have. So what this means is that a base of 3 to the power of x equals 20. And we can solve this a whole bunch of ways. 
We can use logs. We can use change of base rule from the original question. And one way that you can solve any equation is graphically. So to solve an equation graphically, we type in each side of the equation. So I'd have 3 to the power of x, and I'd have 20. And then I think about my window settings. I need to see a y of at least 20, so maybe I'll go up to 25. And I'll hit graph. And it's going to show me that there's a point of intersection. And I press second, trace, go to intersect. And this will be maybe a little bit different on your calculator because I'm using an emulator. But I find that intersection by setting a left boundary. I go a little to the left of it, then a little to the right, and I hit enter. And it tells me there in purple that the x value of intersection is x equals 2.73. I can check whether that equation is correct. You can check any equation's answer by just plugging it in. 3 to the power of 2.73, is it going to give me 20? Well, it's going to be really close. We've got a bit of rounding error. Now, all of these ways of solving are probably nonsense compared to just plugging it in your calculator. So let's go over that. In my calculator, if I press alpha window and I go down, I can choose log base and just type in log base 3 of 20. There we go, 2.73. You can also find it under math. But I did want to take the time to go over graphical solutions because it's something that's guaranteed to come up. You're going to have some equations that you need to solve and you can't solve them analytically. If no base is shown on a logarithm, the base is assumed to be 10. Natural logs, written ln, have a base of e, where e is about 2.72-ish. In the real number system, you can only take the log of a positive number. Logs can come in handy when we're solving equations where the variable's in the exponent. And we'll do this one in just a second. To do that, we may need to exploit our log laws. And here they are. Log base c of a times b is the sum of a couple of logs. Log of a over b is the difference. And here's the big one. Log of a to the n you can pop that exponent down front and get n log a. Some other facts. Logs and powers with the same base are inverse operations, so they undo each other. So 10 to the log a is just a. e to the log a is just a. q to the log base q of a is just a. If you have log base a of a, that's just 1. So for example, log e is just 1, and log with no base shown, so log of 10 is just 1. And log base a of 1 is always 0, so ln 1 is 0, or log with a base of 10 of 1 is just 0. Okay, let's look at this equation. So again, we could solve this one graphically. We could solve it a bunch of ways. I'm going to show you one analytic way and one way with your GDC. First thing I want to do is get it out of scientific notation. So I'll write that 4 to the times 10 to the negative 2 as 0.04. And then I can take the log of both sides. And what the power law of logarithms tells me is that I can pull that exponent down front. And then I can just divide both sides by log 5. I'm going to type that in my calculator. Log of 0 0.04 divided by log 5 turns out to be negative 2. Works out really nicely here, which is fishy. And from there, we can just solve. 2x equals 1, x is a half. I could put it back in and check. Now, there are other ways that you could solve this. You could have switched to a log base 5. You could have taken the natural logarithm of each side and followed those through. But it turns out you could also do this one on paper 1. And the way that we do it is by converting to a common base. So 0 0.04 is 4 one hundredths. And 4 one hundredths is 1 over 25. And the trick here is to convert to a common base. On the left side, we've got 5 to the 2x minus 3. On the right side, 1 over 25 is 5 to the negative 2. And now we say to ourselves, OK, so the expressions are equal, the bases are equal, therefore, 
the exponents must also be equal. And we can work it through this way. x is equal to a half. Now that we've dealt with an exponential equation, let's take a look at a logarithmic equation. And let's remember one of our rules about logarithms. We can't take the log of 0 or a negative number. So whenever we find a solution to a logarithmic equation, we've got to make sure that it does not break these laws. I like to think about logarithmic equations in two different forms. I think of ones that I call converters, which are ones where not all the terms are logs. You make a single log on one side, then you convert to exponential form, solve, and then check. And then I think about droppers, ones where all terms are logs. And in these cases, you create a single log of the same base on each side, and then drop the logs. So this first example is, in my mind, a dropper. You make a single log on each side. So I can add the logs, which means creating a single log through multiplication. That's one of our log laws. And then I can drop the logs. So I end up with x squared plus x on this side, and 2. Oh my gosh, that's a quadratic equation. Let's solve it by making one side 0. We're going to factor it x plus 2 and x minus 1, and then we solve each of those elementary equations. So this is x is negative 2, and this would give us x is 1. And I go through solving quadratic equations in the functions review, if this is looking a little rusty to you as well. The thing we need to do here is check, are both of these numbers OK in the original equation? Let's think, if I put in negative 2 for x, that would break the law. I can't use that number. So that is not a solution, or it's an extraneous root. The other one, the 1, if I put it in, it's no problem at all. I can have the log of 1, and I can have the log of 1 plus 1. I'm not really checking whether the answer's correct, though I certainly could. I'm checking whether I break the law. This other equation, I would consider a converter, but there are many different ways to do it. I will say that the last student that I had that got a 45 felt strongly that this was an easier way to do this one than to turn it into a dropper, but you know everybody will feel differently about what is most comfortable for them. So if I uh, consider it one of these, quote, converters, I make a single log on one side. Okay, so I still have work to do. That's going to be log base 3 of x over 4, and that's equal to 2. And now I convert forms. That means 3 to the 2 equals x over 4, or 9 equals x over 4, or x equals 36. I'm going to check that that doesn't break the law. Can I put a 36 in here for x? Absolutely. That's a number. But again, if you have a different way of doing it, by all means, keep doing what you're doing, assuming that we end up with the same answer. This brings us to the change of base rule, which gives us yet another way of dealing with that pesky question from before, log base 3 of 20. So up until very recently, calculators didn't really like to work in bases other than e and 10. And then before that, there weren't even calculators, so there were tables or slide rules. But one way to do this is to take the log of 20 over the log of 3. Or you could actually use a log of any base, and this trick is going to work. And it's not really a trick, it's a property. You could even go the log base pi of 20 over the log base pi of 3. I guarantee you that all these expressions are going to give you the correct answer of about 2.73. So the change of base rule says the log base b of a can be written this way. The log base c of a over the log base c of b. Now here's a classic question. We've got some expressions, we've got alternate ways of writing them, and says, write the following in terms of x and y only. And these are questions that get botched all the time. So my advice is to split and manipulate until you only have log base a of 2 and log base a of 5, and then go to x and y. So when we see log base a of 20, how does that make us think about 2s and 5s? Well, maybe it makes us think that 20 is 4 times 5. That's helpful. And that could mean log base a of 4, plus log base a of 5. That's our log law of addition or multiplication. And so log base a of 5 is helpful. Log base a of 4 is almost there. 
so I could rewrite it as log base A of 2 squared. And the thing that someone's going to do is they're going to go, oh my gosh, that's an x squared plus y. And that is not what we should be doing. We should keep plugging away at this until we have 2 log base 2 of A. So that came from bringing this exponent down front plus log base A of 5. Now this is safe to work with. That's 2x's plus y. The next one is fishy because it doesn't have a log base A at all, which means that you're probably going to use the change of base rule. Now, I know it says c's here, but that's just to represent that it could be any value. So this could be written as log base A of 2 over log base A of 25, or log base A of 2 over log base A of keep working here until we end up with log base A of 5, which we don't have yet. We've just got log base A of 5 squared. So take the time to pull that power down front, and now we can rewrite this. x is log base A of 2, y is log base A of 5, so this is x over 2y. Just an alternate way of writing them, and showing the IB that you understand how log laws work. That brings us to the next big topic in algebra, which is sequences and series. So arithmetic sequences have a common difference. They increase or decrease through addition of a fixed amount. So a sequence like this would be an arithmetic sequence. You can find the common difference through inspection. I mean, it's going up by 3. By subtracting any two successive terms, or most simply, just by subtracting u1 from u2. The nth term of an arithmetic sequence is given by this expression here. un is u1 plus n minus 1 times d. But I think there's a big value in having some intuitive understanding of what's happening. So let's imagine I wanted to get to u5, and I'm starting at u2. What do I have to do? Well, I can add one common difference. That would get me to u3. Add another one, gets me to u4. Add a third one, that gets me to u5. In other words, u5 is u2 plus 3 jumps to get from 2 to 5, u2 to u5. Generally, you can have this other nifty formula. ub equals ua plus b minus a d. All that means is that you take a number of jumps to get to the next term. Every time you add a d, you're going to the next term. The sum of the first n terms of an arithmetic series is given by those two formulas. So when we say a series, we mean the sum of the terms, just adding them all up. Geometric sequences have a common ratio. They increase or decrease through multiplication. So if I have something like this, negative 6, 2, negative 2 thirds, there's a geometric sequence. One of the easiest ways to find the common ratio is to divide any two successive terms, or better yet, just u2 divided by u1. So in this one, that would be 2 over negative 6. Ah, the common ratio is negative 1 third. That's what I'm multiplying by. The nth term is given by this, un equals u1 times r to the n minus 1. But again, let's think of this intuitively. If I were at u2 and I wanted to get to u5, I would times by r, that would get me to u3. I times by r again, that would get me to u4. I times by r again, that gets me to u5. In other words, u5 is u2 times r cubed. Every time you multiply by r here, you're jumping to the next term. So as a general formula, again, which is not going to be given, you could think about this. But instead of memorizing, maybe just having the idea that every time you multiply by r, you're going to the next term. That might be helpful. The sum of the first n terms is given by this uh, equation right here. Notice here that the minus 1 is a full-size minus 1. It's not up in the exponent. However, in the term formula, it is up in the exponent. And the sum of an infinite geometric series can be found using this, but only if r is between negative 1 and 1. So that IFF means if and only if. So for example, this uh, sequence up here we could find the sum of all infinity terms of it by thinking about, well, it's got a u1 of negative 6. It's got a common ratio of negative 1 third. 
So I could go u1, negative 1 thirds between negative 1 and 1, so this is okay. 1 minus negative 1 third, or negative 6 over 4 thirds. Now remember how you uh, divide fractions, you flip and multiply. So that's going to give us negative 18 over 4, or if you prefer, negative 9 over 2. If you're unconvinced, you can do it in your GDC. Gives us negative 4.5, same answer. So let's try a couple of questions here. An arithmetic sequence has u20 of 62, and s20 is 670. They're not giving us uh, what d is or what u1 is. We've got to find those. So I could use this information here to say u20, and I'm going to think about it intuitively, is u1 plus 19 jumps. Okay, I could also do that through the formula. And if I substitute in here, that would be 62 equals u1 plus 19 jumps. Uh, I'm not going to be able to solve directly. There are two unknowns in one variable. But I can use the other information. I have two formulas for the sum of the first n terms of an arithmetic series. Either one of these formulas will work, but the first one's going to be better in this case because it's going to have fewer unknowns in it. It's worth noting at this point that in both of these situations, n is 20. So s20 is 670, when n is 20, so that's 20 over 2. u1 is unknown, and then this would be u20 that we're talking about, that un, so that would be 62. And we can probably solve this without a GDC. That's 10 u1 plus 62, or 670 is 10 u1 plus 620. Move that 620 over, we get 50 equals 10 u1. Hey -o, u1 is 5. And once we know that, we can use this result over here. So we get 62 is 5 plus 19d, or 57 is 19d, or d is 3. Again, not the only way that we can solve this, but it gets us there. Next one talks about a geometric sequence. u1 is 2, and the common ratio is 3. Which term number will be the first to exceed 1 million? So what we're thinking here is that un has to be greater than a million. And for us, un is going to be 2, 3 to the n minus 1. I can think of a bunch of ways to solve this, um, but one of the slickest might be to solve graphically. And we're going to solve the equation by putting in the left side and the right side. In for y1 and y2. So 2 times 3 to the power of x minus 1. Okay, notice that minus 1 is up there in the exponent. And then the other one's 1 million. I need to think about window settings. Uh, my y max needs to be at least a million, so let's make it 2 million. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. And I can hit graph. And I don't see the answer yet, so I need to see some more x's. I could zoom out if I wanted. But if I just change this window setting, now I can see there's a point of intersection. And I'll go second, trace, and use the intersect function. I go a little to the left, hit enter, a little to the right, hit enter. And in purple, it tells me that the answer is 12.94. That's where it's going to be exactly a million. But there's no 12.94th term, so we've got to go to the 13th term. Now, you could have also solved this using logarithms, just like we did early in the presentation. Another thing that you can do is use these functions and go second graph to see the table. And it will tell you what's going on in y1 with the sequence. You can see that u12 is 354,294, and u13 is 1 million and a bit. Therefore, the 13th term. If you're going to use the table, you do need to show that it is the 13th term that is the first to exceed. So you need to show u12 
and U13. But the table can be really helpful, especially with sequences and series. This brings us to sigma notation. Sigma means the sum. So the expression right here says you put in p values from 4 to 7 into that expression, and then you just add up the results. So if I put in 4, that would be 4 squared minus 20. If I put in 5, that would be 5 squared minus 20, and so on. And the sigma means add up those results. So 16 minus 20 is negative 4. The next one, 25 minus 20 is 5. 36 minus 20 is 16. 49 minus 20 is 29. Add them all up, we get 46. If you have many, many terms, then my suggestion is to write out the first few terms and look for a pattern. So let's imagine that we have this one right here. I'll put in q equals 6. So that would be 3 times 2 to the 6. And we go, go to the GDC and figure out that that's 192. I can put in q to the 7. That's 3 times 2 to the 7, which is 384. If I put in 8, I'll get 3 times 2 to the 8, which is 768. Either by looking at those numbers or just by thinking about, hold on, we're timesing by 2 more for every term, you might notice that this is a geometric series. And that might help us out. Now, it's not the only way to evaluate this, but u1 is 192. Uh, the common ratio here is 2. We're going from q of 6 to q of 20. So that would be in a separate geometric series that starts right here. Let's call this u1 in the geometric series. There would be 15 terms. Okay. So we can go ahead and use our geometric series formula. S15 would be U1, which is 192. 2 to the 15 minus 1, all over 2 minus 1. Let's check that out on the calculator. So 192 times 2 to the power of 15. And I'm really careful here. This is a big minus 1. All divided by 2 minus 1, which is just 1. We get 6,291,264 exactly. So here I'm talking about writing out the first few terms to get a sense of what's going on in the series. Um, but actually, the simplest way to do these questions is to just dump them into your GDC as is. If I press alpha window, there's a summation function here. And I could go from x is 6 all the way to 20 of 3 times 2 to the power of x. And it gives me the same answer. But if these come up on paper 1, or if the variable is somewhere weird, as it often is in an IB question, then you may need to look at what the actual pattern is. This brings us to an application of exponential growth, or geometric sequences, which is compound interest. Let's define these variables. fv is future value. pv is present value. r is the nominal annual interest rate, or the named or posted rate. k is the number of compounding periods per year. And n is the number of years. In compound interest, you earn interest on interest. Or if it's a debt, you pay interest on interest. Barrett invests $10,000 at 9% per annum, or per year, compounded quarterly. Find the value after 10 years. So this 10,000 here is the PV. 9 is going to be our R, compounded quarterly. That means 4 times per year. So K is 4, and N is 10. This is really just plug and chug in the formula. I subbed it in. Let's grab the GDC. I'm hitting alpha y equals to get this nice fraction button. And I'm going to figure out what 4 times 10 is myself. To the power of 40, we get this. To the nearest dollar, 
24,352. So he made about $14,350. Find the effective annual interest rate. So even though it's posted as 9%, because you earn interest on interest, the effective annual rate is going to be a little bit different. And here's my hack for finding this annual interest rate, or the rate that would go with the yearly geometric sequence. Make present value equal to 100 and n equal to 1. See what happens to $100 in one year. Let's plug that in. And we get $109.31. That means that the interest rate must have been 9.31%. Okay, because if it had been 9%, you'd have $109 at the end of that year. You have $9.31, so that's 9.31%. If we compare that with simple interest, simple interest means that he's going to earn 9% of $10,000 every year. Simple interest is linear. 9% of $10,000 is $900. So he's going to have his $10,000, and he's going to add on $900 for every year, plus 900, plus 900, 10 times. Ah, better way to write that would be 10 times 900. And he'd end up with $19,000. So compound interest has made him a bunch more money. We could have a formula for simple interest, but simple interest doesn't tend to really exist in the real world, so we're not going to worry too much. For the super keeners, we could do something like this as an equation. But again, what's given in your formula booklet is compound interest, and that's what you're most likely to run into. Moving along to logic and show that questions. If the command term is show that, you just do the problem. Don't work backwards, make sure that you take the left side and turn it into the right side, or justify why they're equal. They're just being nice enough to tell you the answer in case you can't get it but need it for the next part of the question, but again, don't work backwards. You can do these as two column proofs, though you don't have to. Um, so in this case, we want to show that this equals that. In a show that question, the answer doesn't really matter that much because they already gave you the answer. The communication of why the answer is correct is what's important. So here I'm subtracting fractions. I need a common denominator, so I'm going to show that. So I'd have x over x by x plus 1 minus x plus 1 over x by x plus 1. And that would allow me to put these together in a single fraction. And I'd be careful to show that I'm subtracting all of x plus 1. And that's over x by x plus 1. And then I will go ahead and I'll show that I'm going to subtract these all off. So I'm not going to do something ridiculous like divide those out. That's bad. That is not how we reduce fractions. We clean up the top. And so I get negative 1 over x squared plus x. Ta-da! Again, a two-column proof is fine here, uh, but not necessary. Binomial expansion. So the coefficients come from Pascal's triangle. I like to write Pascal's triangle without a head, like this, so 1, 1, then 1, 2, 1. So all the exterior numbers are 1. All the interior numbers come from the sum of the two above them. So 1 plus 1 makes 2. 1 plus 2 makes 3, 3 plus 3 makes 6, and so on. So you could generate the next row by going 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. You don't need to memorize it, but you do need to know its rules of production so that you can get it at need. What the numbers represent, if I do this headless triangle, is the fourth row tells me what 4C0 is. Then the next one tells me 4c1, 4c2, 4c3, and 4c4, and so on. Another way that you could find these values is through the formula. So if I wanted, say, 4c3, I could go 4 factorial over 3 factorial, 4 minus 1 factorial, and just work that out, which would be 4 factorial, or 4 times 3 factorial, 
all over 3 factorial, 1 factorial, which is just 4, as we expected it to be. Remember that factorial, so if you see something like 5 factorial, it means 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Or algebraically, n factorial would mean n by n minus 1 by n minus 2, and so on, all the way down to 1. One of the reasons that we care about combinations in Pascal's triangle is to expand binomials. So this is a binomial to the power of 4. So I go to the fourth row of Pascal's triangle. That gives me my initial coefficients of 1, 4, 6, 4, and 1. I'm going to get terms that come out of each of these. And now I take the first term in the binomial, and I raise it to the power of 4. And in every subsequent term, its powers start to go down. So power of 1, and then it won't appear at all in the last term. I take the second term in the binomial, negative x, and it starts to make its appearance in the second term of the expansion, and its powers go upward. It's worth noting here that you could also have called this 1 4c0, this one's 4c1, and so on. But since we had the triangle, it saved us evaluating all of those combinations. It's like a neat little combination calculator. In my next step, I'm just going to evaluate the exponents. I'll remember that negative x squared is a positive, that negative x cubed is a negative, and that negative x to the 4 is going to be a positive. Finally, I'll simplify. 1 times 16 is 16, minus 32x, plus 24x squared, minus 8x cubed, plus x to the 4. If we do this correctly, there should be absolutely no like terms to collect. They're all already dealt with, and it's a lot faster than multiplying it out four times. Though if you're completely stuck on an exam, I guess you could do that. Here comes an important word, hence. That means from here, or you could think of it as using what you just found. Find the coefficient of x squared in this. Now this is not just a binomial expansion. It's got two different binomials in it. But I actually know what this works out to be. I just found it over here. That's the hence part we're going to use, so let's write it out. That's what this all means. If we wanted to multiply this out, then we'd have to do all the terms together. We'd have 10 separate multiplications to do. And these ones, and these ones, and these ones, and so on. But we only care about the x squared terms. So let's think about which of these arrows are going to give us an x squared. This one right here. 3 times 3x times negative 32x gives us a negative 96x squared. And this negative 1 times 24x squared gives us negative 24x squared. None of the other terms will be x squared terms. If you want to, you can multiply them all out, but it's going to be a bit of a waste of time for this particular question. Put them together. How many x squareds do you have? Negative 120x squareds. And then, for whatever reason, they're being a jerk in the question and saying, don't give us the term, just give us the coefficient. So your final answer should be negative 120, and they'll dock you a mark if you put the x squared in there, if they ask for just the coefficient. Here we go with one last binomial expansion question. We want to find the constant term in the expansion of this. And let's imagine that we don't have any extra insight into this. I could use Pascal's triangle, um, but since it's power of 6, I know the first term is going to start with a 6c0, and it's going to have its first part of the binomial raised to the power of 6. The next term is going to be a 6c1. It'll have its power raised to 5 for the 2x squared, and then the second term will start to appear, and so on. And honestly, it does not take that much time just to write out even the full expansion, though that's probably overkill here. But I can look for patterns in these. x squared to the 6, this term, this first term, is going to have an x to the 12. 
This next term is going to have an x to the 10 type term times negative 1 over x. Oh my gosh, it's going to be an x to the 9 type term. Uh, this one over here would have an x to the 8. I don't care about all the numbers. And that would be times 1 over x squared. Oh my gosh, it would be an x to the 6. So it looks like the powers are going x12, x9, x6. What do you think the next term is going to be? I think it's going to be an x to the 3. And we could work it out and find that that's true. The next term, then, is going to be an x to the 0. And that's what a constant term is, an x to the 0 term. So that would be 2x squared. Now, we're going to get confirmation of this when we actually work it out. But this is the term that we care about. Everything else is, is not really that important to us. So let's work this out, 6c4. To get your combinations, it may be a little bit different from calculator to calculator. In this one, I press math, I go over to PRB, and I choose NCR. And I type in 6C4. I think on a real TI-84, you've got to press the 6 first. But 6C4 is 15. We could have also made Pascal's triangle. 2x squared, all squared, would be 4x to the 4. And negative 1 over x, all to the 4, would be a positive x to the 4. Oh my gosh, so we'd get 60x4 over x4, or just 60. If you took the time to do the full expansion, you would also find that that is the constant term. I'll just mention a couple of things here. If you have a plus b to the n, there are n plus 1 terms in the expansion, and that's because it was going to start at nc0, go all the way up to ncn. Another nifty formula that is not given to us um, is this, that the r plus 1th term in the expansion of a plus b to the n would be this, ncr a to the n minus r b to the r. You don't necessarily need this. I think it's just as good to do what we just did up here. Um, but if you were able to reason out that it's the fifth term that we need, then you'd go 6, C4. A is the first term in our binomial, so that would be 2x squared to the power of 6 minus 4. And B is the second term in our binomial to the power of R, which is 4. And that's going to give you the exact same answer that we got over here of 60. That brings us to the end of the major topics in algebra. I hope this has been helpful. Good luck with the material, and take care, folks.